Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, I'm Mike, and I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for the previous speakers. I was quite happy sitting there listening to them, but it's my turn now. And, um, you know, if you're new, welcome, like others have said tonight. Um, I, like others as well, sincerely hope that you find here what I did uh, a little over ten years ago. Um, Wednesday this week, uh, ten years ago, was the last time I had a drink. Um, It was a drink like many others that had gone before it. I was driving home from work. The thought came into my head that I was a bit early. It wouldn't matter if I popped in for a quick pint in the pub. And, uh, you know, I had an intention of just drinking one. Um, Should have known that wasn't going to happen, you know. But crazy thinking, took that drink and went on another massive bender, you know. And that was my history for 20 years, you know. I started drinking at the age of 14. And it was a bottle of cider in a local park with some mates from school. And it instantly changed the way that I felt about myself. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't, I wasn't conscious of the fact that I felt insecure. I wasn't conscious of the fact that I didn't fit in. You know, I just, just didn't feel right. But having that drink just seemed to light up my life, you know, and I was very ill. I remember going home, throwing up. The room was spinning. I was sweating, but there was no, you know, there was definitely no thought of not doing it again. You know, I was planning it already to do it again the next Friday night. And that carried on for a few years, you know. I mean, there weren't any consequences. I was living at home with my mum and dad. And, you know, it didn't change. It just just started drinking more often. And then and then I left school and I took a job. And I had a fairly, fairly decent job, you know. I mean, quite a lot was expected of me. And uh, I had to face responsibility probably for, for the first time in my life. And I struggled with that. Do you know what I mean? I, I felt uncomfortable. I didn't feel like I was doing as well as I should. I didn't feel I was being recognized as well as I should. I was restless, irritable, and discontent, like it says in the book, you know, and um started drinking at lunchtime. You know, that seemed like a good idea. And uh, on occasions, I didn't make it back to work. I'd come up with weird and wonderful excuses as to why I couldn't get back. You know what I mean? I'd just outright lie, you know make up dramas and all that kind of thing just so I could carry on. And, you know, it was a slow progression over that 20 years, really. You know, 23, 24, I had a brush with the law, lost my license to drive. Got a bit of a disciplinary at work, you know, but it didn't teach me anything um, because alcohol for me was the only thing that seemed to put any joy into my life. It just seemed to bring colour to it. And... Um, But like others have said tonight, you know, Gail talked about it. You know, when I take a drink, the reaction that I have is not like the normal person, the normal temperate drinker. I can go out with a firm, you know, absolutely firm idea that I'm only going to have a couple of pints and I'll be home by, you know, 11 o'clock and it'll all be all right. That doesn't happen for someone like me. You know, I take a drink and I get that sense of ease and comfort and then that phenomenon kicks in. And I just carry on until I'm completely wasted. Do you know what I mean? And um, I don't want to be doing it, but I've got no control. I've got no power over it. It just happens. And then I wake up with those usual feelings of remorse. You know, I didn't want to do it. I'm sorry. You know, I mean it. But I'm going to do it again because I've got no power. You know, within a couple of days, the dust is settled, the heat's come off, and I'm starting to feel that, you know, wang sponsor talks about it, that sort of knot in the stomach that tightens. You know, the further I go without a drink, that knot tightens, and I'm becoming more and more irritable. Everybody's getting on my nerves again. And I just think the only way out of this is to take a drink, and I just do it all again. And um, as I say, so 2006, I come through those doors for the first time on a Sunday night place was packed just like tonight full of people that were smiling they didn't look like me at all do you know what i mean i was full of fear i didn't really know if i was alcoholic or not um i knew i had a problem um i'd broken down the day before after yet another you know another bad drink um but i came along and was faced with 
you know, a bunch of happy people. And they all took time out to come and speak to me, told me a little bit about their stories. And um, I started to relate, you know, I started to, you know, I've done that. Yeah, I've done that. And um, I was told to sit and listen, do you know what I mean? Just sit and listen. And um, in those days we had a little mini meeting that was that was downstairs. And I remember John did the share that evening. You know, John's, John's recently come back and I'm grateful for that. I remember him sharing that evening and um, coming up here and listening to the, you know, the, the, the other shares and um, amazing. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely amazing. It was like, my God, this is what's been wrong with me. You know, I'm, I'm suffered with alcoholism. When I drink, I can't control it. It doesn't matter how bad it gets, I will always do it again. You know, I've got that insanity around the taking of the first drink. And I gave in, do you know what I mean? That night I gave in, I got a sponsor, I got a big book. And I became willing to do things that seemed irrelevant. You know, I was given a, a white card just for the day card, told to read it, try to do some of the things that were on it every day. Um, you know, ring my sponsor every day, ring some people in the group. You know, I was the newest person there, I think, that night. And... Um, but ring people, ask them how their day was. Didn't want to do it, do you know what I mean? But I did. And um, read my big book, you know, ring a sponsor, pray. You know, get on my knees and pray. And at that point, I didn't really believe in anything. You know, and I want to thank John. You know, I remember meeting him at coffee at Dingle's, probably that the Monday after the first meeting, and we sat down. And I was talking to him about this, you know, higher power and God. And, and he just said, look, you know, can be something as simple as the group. Do you know what I mean? There's a group of people there that are, you know, have recovered. That's a power greater than me. Do you know, is what he said. And yeah, I could, I could, I could do that. Do you know what I mean? I could believe in that. And um, so that was that was the early beginning of my belief in a higher power, and it was the group. And um, you know what a group this is. But I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you know, so I became willing to do these things, and I was ringing my sponsor every day, and uh, within a few weeks, you know, within a week I'd brightened up. I was living on my own, I was separated from my wife at that point, I was living on my own, um, but I was feeling good by the end of that week, do you know what I mean? I was feeling better, and uh, hope had come into my life, I could see that this was working. And my sponsor took me through the steps, you know, one by one, in the order, um, I remember doing the prayer, on my knees, you know, step three prayer in his little annex off his house. And um, coming away from that, thinking, thank God, do you know what I mean? Just thank God. You know, I've always tried to control everything, do you know what I mean? I want life to be how I want it to be, and when it don't work, you know, I get irritable and I'll drink, you know, that's, that's how it is. But I just thought, thank God, you know, I, I, it was like something had been lifted at that point. And I started to get down to step four. And, you know, for anybody who's new, you know, this is just a bit of my experience. Do a thorough step four. You know, be fearless and thorough like it asks. Don't, you know, and if you're unsure about anything, talk to your sponsor and write it down. Do you know what I mean? Don't leave anything uncovered. Because um, it will come back to bite you later. Do you know what I mean? I found out at great cost, but that's another story. Um, so shared my four with my sponsor. Um, didn't take very long, a couple of hours, two, three hours. Um, and at that point, again, it was like another sort of awakening. Do you know, it was like, again, described it before as like carrying around a heavy bag that's dragging you down. You can't look the world in the eye. You know, you, you, you're not really a part of life. And taking that bag off, it was like I straightened up. I could look the world in the eye again. And I felt completely different. And, um, you know, that was the beginnings for me, I think, of that spiritual awakening, that change of thought and attitude. And um, got down to the rest of the program, you know, making amends to the people that are hurt. Step eight for me was, I didn't like, I didn't like what I was writing down, do you know I mean? I could actually see for the first time who I was, what I'd done to people. And my first attempt at step eight was shocking, to be honest. Do you know what I mean? I did a half-ass job at it. And the sponsor said, come on, bring, bring your step eight round. And I remember driving out there, clutching this pad. And I knew it was crap, do you know what I mean? I just knew it was crap. And um, I walked in and sort of, it's crap. And he said, well, I'll be the judge of that. 
looked through it and said, you're right, it's crap, we'll do it again. <laughs> and, um, you know, but I needed that, do you know what I mean? I needed that kick up the ass, and I went off and did a proper step eight, and then was able to go on and make amends. And um, another part of recovery, do you know what I mean? Again, feeling further removed, you know, um, and the fear had subsided, you know, I mean, my life has always been based on fear and, and you know, emotion, and I can't live like that, do you know what I mean, I'm, I'm not equipped to do it, and I need a higher power in my life, I need a sponsor, and I've got to thank John for taking me through the steps, and Wayne for sponsoring me for the last 18 months, um, you know, because without that, I wouldn't be still here tonight. You know, I was talking to Jamie before the meeting. We are, I mean, it's a class of 2006, and for anybody who's new, you know, we have sort of year classes in the, within the group. And um, I remember when we all first met up, there was a breakfast that we had for the class of 2006, and it was down at the uh, Marina Club, I think, on the Barbican. And I don't know at what point in the year it was, but there were 17 of us at that year, you know, at that breakfast. Um, the three of us left do you know what I mean there's me Jamie and Alison and um, I don't know where those other people are do you know what I mean slowly over time they've, they've disappeared whether they're still working the programme or not who knows but for me there is nowhere else do you know what I mean this is my sanctuary I know Wayne talks about it a lot you know over the last couple of years my life is through a lot of my own actions, um, it's taken a lot of different turns. Do you know what I mean? Turns that could have, would have easily, easily caused me to, to slip, drink. You know, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen for a number of reasons. Do you know what I mean? It didn't happen because one, this group and the people in it. Two, sponsorship. Three, you know, the, the, the program that's been put into me, the basics that have been put into me, the ability to actually have some humility, shut up and do what I'm told. You know, um, I'm a partner. You know, I've got to thank my partner as well. Um, all of those elements have allowed me to pick myself up, dust myself off and continue marching. And um, I couldn't be more grateful for that. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, like somebody telling me, John, you know, I'm a sick man without this program. There's no doubt about it. I can be a bit of a sick man with this program. Do you know what I mean? I don't get it all right. Um, you know, resentments are still, there's still resentments. Life still carries on. Do you know what I mean? And, um, just because I work this program doesn't mean that I don't get resentments. It doesn't mean that people still don't annoy me, you know, wind me up. It still doesn't mean life doesn't go always the way that I would like it to go, you know, and I have to find some acceptance around that, and um, I don't always get it right, you know what I mean, and it just manufactures misery for myself, and, um, but I'm doing better than I was, you know, and that's, that's what this program asks for us, you know, that we, we continue to progress, and, um, you know, I, I believe in God today, um, you know, I, 100%, you know, there is no way that... I could have got through what I got through without having that firm belief, do you know what I mean? As well as the other things that I've already talked about. And, um, you know, for somebody who's new tonight, you know, 10 years, when I walked through those doors on that Sunday night, if somebody said to me, you know, I'm 10 years sober, I would have thought that that was an absolute, you know, mountain that could not be climbed, you know, it was, it was light years away. You know, and I guess anybody, you know, even anybody who's come in here would think that. But actually, if you get a sponsor, you know, give yourself to this program, attend this group, um, do the things that you're asked to do, act on the information received, you know, it flies by. You know, it's unbelievable how quick that time's gone. Despite all the challenges and changes and everything else, it's gone quickly. And... um you know, a lot of it has been great joy. Some of it has been great sadness as well. You know, and I expect that will continue in the future. You know, life goes on, as I say. But where am I today? Do you know what I mean? I'm in a good place today. Um, you know, I'm in a strange place, really. I mean, my whole life has changed without, you know, there's, it's nothing like it used to be, you know. Um, 
I worked in a professional job for 25 years, which came to an end through no fault of my own. The government just decided to restructure things, and I thought I was going to be in that job for life. And it wasn't to be, do you know what I mean? He had other plans for me, obviously. And um, and I ended up working in a retail shop that then closed down after one year, and I thought I was pretty settled there as well. And now I'm a market trader in Plymouth City Market. I mean, I'm light years away from, again, what I've, what I've been used to doing, you know. But I'm loving it. I'm enjoying it. It's, it's partner isn't because she says that all I talk about in my sleep is light bulbs and wiper blades. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But, you know, so be it. Um, but I'm loving it. Do you know what I mean? It, whether it was meant, you know, it's obviously meant to be. And um, it's just amazing, really, that, you know, someone like me, screwed up as I am, sick man like John talked about, by coming here and listening, do you know what I mean? That's the first thing, if you knew, listen, do you know what I mean? Um, you know nothing about alcoholism, if you knew. I knew nothing about alcoholism. I knew how to drink, I knew how to get drunk, I knew how to lie, I knew how to manipulate, um, and all the things that go with it. I knew how to destroy other people's feelings and emotions and destroy friendships and all that lot. Didn't know how to recover, you know, and, um, but you guys did. And, you know, that message was as strong then as it is tonight. You know, shut up, get a sponsor, you know, listen, get a big book, read bits of it, you know, read that first 63 pages, you know, um, talk to your sponsor every day, think of others, you know, rather than yourself. Pur first purpose, you know, first purpose of those phone calls to others is to take me out of my own thinking. Um, do you just for the day card? Try and do the things that are on it. You won't do it all, but you know, be willing to try. Um, pray. Do that gratitude list. You know, reflect on it. Look at your day. Where have you gone wrong? And make that amends quickly if you need to. Don't live in the problem. You know, and um, amazing things. You know, and. The one thing that my sponsor says to me a lot is that, you know, live by structure, not emotion. And um, I don't always get that right either, but I try. Do you know what I mean? And um, I'm just a very lucky person to have this, you know, and I want I want the newcomer to feel that hope. Do you know what I mean? If, if, if you've got, you know, you don't even have to be new to be experiencing problems. Do you know what I mean? Um, if you, even if you're not new, you know, just get honest and talk to your sponsor. Um, but if you are new, you know, give in, stop the fighting, do you know what I mean? It's, it's hard. I was sick and tired of feeling sick and tired, do you know what I mean? Give in. Get that sponsor, be willing to listen, you know, be willing to do things that you're going to think are wacko. You know, you might not, you might not agree with your sponsor, just don't tell him, do you know what I mean? Just, just do what he asks. And um, you will recover. Do you know what I mean? You will recover despite yourself. And um, you can look forward to a, a life that is just just fantastic, just completely different to one that you could ever imagine. And, um, you know, for... I, mean, I don't get usually lost for words. I have plenty to talk about when I'm in my stall in the market, you know what I mean? But tonight I'm kind of drying up here. So I'm going to say thanks very much. I'm going to say, you know, to the, again, to the new person, just act on the information received, give in, and do what, do what you're asked to do. And you can look forward to a life that, you know, you, you couldn't, couldn't expect, um, safe and protected, you know, removed from that alcoholic problem. And, um, I'm loving my life. You know, there's still room for improvement, but I'm sure it'll happen. And I'm very grateful to be here and thanks very much. Have a bit of order here, please. My name's Wayne and I'm an alcoholic. Hey. Just a, a roadie rabble. I'm really nervous. Oh. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> it's 12 months ago to the day that I last did the main share at this group, which is appalling. Nobody loves me. It's terrible, isn't it? Oh. But anyway, if you're new... Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, because if you find what I've found here, you are going to have a truly remarkable life. I've just had an amazing time in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
Bill Wilson described it as a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes, and, and that's been my experience. I mean, I've just, I've just had a, a brilliant time, but I've also stayed sober through more pain than I ever thought possible. So this works under all conditions. Now, I was once just riddled with turmoil and, and emotional conflict. You know, my, my head would just be rife with just, just, just torture myself. And I, I just could see no way of dealing with it. It was like, you know, I just preferred being drunk than sober. I preferred living life for a drunken haze, just one step removed from everybody else. You know, I could just walk through town and put my headphones on and a drink. And there'd just be something between me and everybody else. And, and nobody could get in and hurt me because I worried and I, I was, I always thought I was so sensitive, you know, and people upset me easily because I, I was, I was just sensitive. That's the, that's the way I believed I was. And I would, uh, you know, I, 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 I would just go through life, you know, just with, with that, just discomfort. You know, any any social situation, you know, I'd be, I'd go downtown, I'd go in a shop, and you know, panic attacks, and I'd, I'd, I'd sweat, and, and and I would just feel socially awkward. You know, I, I, I think people were always laughing at me. They just look at me the wrong way, and, and you know, I'd be walking down the road, you know, you. Just, I'd be, I just start walking funny. I just get so self-censored. And it was just an, an awful way to live. You know, I'd be in my bed sit and I shared this story. I've only got one story, but there are new people here that haven't heard it. You know, I would, I would sit in my, my bed sit and, and I would hear the, the, a car go down outside. And I just remember, you know, I'd hear that car, just, just a car. And I would just jump out my skin. You know, I would just, you know, somebody would ring the doorbell and my knees would physically knock together. And somebody occasionally would let somebody in downstairs and I'd be in the top and I'd hear them coming up the stairs and get louder, 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 louder. And then they tap out a, gla out a glass door and they go, in the absolute, in utter terror. And, and it, it was never any, it was usually just my girlfriend. It was nothing. But the only thing that would ever relieve me of that torture and that awful feeling was the sense of ease and comfort which came instantly by taking a few drinks, and I just get just just, just need the the you know the, that ping of that kind of superintendence, you know, or the, just the distinctive sound of the crack of the bottle of vodka. You know, I just crack that vodka, and I would almost instantly feel better. You know, all of a sudden, from being somebody that was just just absolutely riddled in fear and just couldn't speak to people, I became somebody where the party was at. You know, if you didn't want to be with me. Then it was your loss. It just didn't. It just changed me. It just changed me significantly for the better. You know, I, I just felt. I just felt okay. I, I felt. I felt. I, I could have fun. I could be what I wanted to be. I could be what you wanted to be, and, and, and it, it just brought color and imagination to my life. And I, unfortunately, I, I would drink, and I would drink too much. I, I would. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd start drinking and I would say, well, you know, I'd just, I'll have a quarter bottle of vodka at a time. I, I'd, I'd buy a bottle, I'd go down and buy another bottle and they'd say something like, if you buy half bottle, it'd be cheaper. And I'd say, okay, I just could not control my drinking. I tried putting coins in my pockets. I tried, I tried tying knots in pieces of string to, and undoing the knots when I had drinks. And I tried every way imaginable of controlling my drinking and my behavior. And the result was zero. I tried doctors, counselors, treatment facilities, and I even tried Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I went into this treatment facility, and I, I went in there, and, and I've shared this hundreds of times before, I went in there a miserable, suicidal alcoholic. A few weeks later, I emerged a miserable, suicidal amateur psychiatrist. I came out, and they said to me, just go to AA, and they could go to meetings. And I, and I, I, would, I would go to meetings, and, but I would do what the examples around me were also doing. You know, I was told I had to get in touch with something. I had to get in touch with my feelings, my inner this, my inner that, and all this other nonsense. And I, I would share at meetings, every meeting, and I would tell you how awful life was and, and how, how just it was everybody else's fault except for me. And sometimes I would be there and I'd share and I would conjure up a tear and I'd be crying and there'd be tears coming down my eyes. And people would come up to me after the meeting. They'd put their arms around me and say, Wayne, that was a great share. It was just gut level honesty. And it never, ever treated my alcoholism. Just attending meetings, listening to horror stories did nothing to affect my condition. 
And I went to these meetings, and don't get me wrong, there were, a lot, there were lots of bright, colorful characters, good, good, well-meaning people that kept me coming back. But there was nothing that I heard of any substantial depth or weight which was going to treat my condition. And I've since understood that anybody here, you can, you can go to the, the best meeting in the world. You can sit in the middle of the best meeting in the world, week in, week out. But if you do not take the 12 steps, if you are like me, your life will get progressively and systematically worse over any prolonged period. I had to take the 12 steps. And one night, a bizarre reason, I, I went to a different venue. So I went to a different, the same venue on a different night. So I went, I went to a different group and I went to see the people that they warned me about. Keep away from them. You know, there was always names, you know, the, the God Squad, the Joy Boys, the, the Magnificent. It was just, they just had names. Keep away from them because we don't like them. Keep away from them. And I came across these people. In that night, for the first time, I saw, I felt, and I believed. I saw, I felt, and I believed that there was more to Alcoholics Anonymous than previously met the eye. These guys were on fire. These guys had a solution. You know, they had a, a purpose. They spoke with conviction. These guys set the room on fire. These, these guys inspired me to take action. You know, they, they got me, and, and they would say the same crap every week, you know, big book sponsor steps, big book sponsor steps. And it, it, but it occurred to me. The reason they keep repeating themselves, every single one of them, was for me. Because that is what I have to do if I wish to recover. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. But if you want to recover, you have to take the steps. There are, there are actions I am required to do. Because for me, abstinence from alcohol was no effective solution for my condition. Because people would say to me, I mean, remember my mother, she would say to me, Wayne, you've got to stop drinking. You've got to stop drinking. And I just wanted to scream at her. You, you don't understand. When I drink, when I'm under the influence of alcohol, I feel okay. When I'm not drinking, the world is just hell. You know, it's like walking through a tunnel full of jagged glass and it's just painful. Who wouldn't want to drink? It, it was just horrendous. So, you know, just going to meetings was not going to it was not going to cut it for me. It was going to be nowhere near sufficient to overcome my alcoholism. And I came across these people, and they come up with all this stuff. And, you know, they told me I was suffering from a condition which only a spiritual experience would conquer. But the most satisfactory years of my existence lie ahead if I could take the actions. And this, this was, this was, I mean, what great news. I mean, what news for, for a hopeless alcoholic who can see no way out whatsoever, who feels that they've tried every port of call to be given a promise like that. You know, you know what, what an, an amazing thing. The most satisfactory years of my existence lie ahead. And that can be true. That's always going to be true. Because if I'm growing spiritually, it's, it's going to get better. I'm not necessarily going to have a bigger and a bigger and a bigger house or a better and a better and a better car. But if I'm growing spiritually, you know, things are going to improve. So these guys said about getting a, a sponsor, and uh, gee, I, I've got bad taste in sponsors, I tell you, because this guy just didn't like me. I mean, I, I picked this guy, and any I would ring him up, and I would say, oh, <laughs> "She's done it again. It's a girlfriend. She's moaning. She's doing this. Oh my god!" And he would say, "Well, well, bless you, lad. Have you read your big book today?" He said, "Well." And I'd bring him up at the time, and he'd say, "Well, your stories touch me deeply. You know, go and work with a newcomer." I think, well, what? You know, why do I want to go and speak to a newcomer when the problem is over here? The problem is clearly my relationship. I want to talk about my relationship. You know, the, that's the problem. So why have I got to go over there and talk to another bloke? That's not going to help. But I started following these ridiculous, irrelevant suggestions. I started following this simple daily plan of action and like Johnny has just said, remarkably and quickly my outlook brightened up. From somebody that had no hope whatsoever I became able to see that I could actually have a life free of alcohol and actually enjoy sobriety. Well, I, mean, that, I mean that's just an amazing, you know, when, when you get that for the first time, I mean that is just such 
I mean, I mean, you just want to scream it from the hilltops. You want you 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 you, you want to tell other alcoholics. You you you. I mean, you just want to be positive about it. You, want, you know, this is what we found is truly remarkable. I mean, it's the envy of every treatment facility in the world what we have here. So I would uh, go to meetings and 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 I'd be sharing with my buddy, and we'd be you know, like a lot of people do. You know, when they're new and they find this remarkable thing, you know, they whack in the big book and you make all the mistakes and all the rest of it, but. It's just, it was just just a, a phase, and you know, my sponsor said to me, "You know, if you're going to talk like this, if you're going to nail your colours to the mast," was the words he used. Be prepared to be unpopular. I have never been a person who is prepared to sit quietly in the dull grey twilight. I will always stand up for what I have done for what has worked for me in what I'm going to pass on to other people. I will not compromise for anybody because what I found here works and it is absolutely second to none. This works, end of. And I, I would, you know, I would listen to this guy and, and, and this sponsor. And, I mean, the, 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 the thing was, I mean, often we, we often hear people say, oh, I've got a sponsor. But really, it's not a sponsor I need. What I need is sponsoring. There's a big difference. I need to allow myself to be sponsored. It's pointless having a sponsor, not being honest and not following direction. You know, I needed, I needed to, to, to seek advice and accept direction and implement that information if I was going to have any chance of recovery. And, and that's what I did. You know, I allowed myself to be sponsored. I allowed, I allowed myself to do these things, you know, and, and I, you know, eventually my sponsor died, and then I got, a, I got, a, I got another one. I mean, an, an, another, another, another complete fool who just, he just didn't seem to understand. I mean, this guy, he, he got me taking these stupid actions, and he wanted me to keep doing them. You know, keep, you know, why have I got to keep doing all, all these actions which seem irrelevant to the problem? And I, I would, you know, ring. I mean, the first time I met him, I mean, this, this is if you, if you knew, if you knew, if if you, I mean, I've always flourished on mean, moody, nasty sponsors. That's how they're often perceived by other people. I would, uh, and let me give you an example. I'd been calling my new sponsor for six months every week. I'd called him, emailed him every week. I'd never met him. And one night he was in a meeting. Uh, he was over, he was, he, was, he, was a, he was a different country. And uh, someone said, there is. I was going to just about to meet him. And I'd waited so long and I really wanted to meet him. And I, and I put my hand and I said, hi, I'm Wayne. And he looked at me with this sort of glazed expression. I, I said, I'm Wayne. You sponsor me. You've been sponsoring me for six months. I've been calling you every week. He just looked me square in the eye. He put two hands on my head and said, you'll never drink again, kid. And off he went. I mean, that's... <laughs> no. The old me would have said, well, screw you. But by the time I'd got to my seat, which is where I went sharply, which is was no further than where John is there now, in my mind, I, you know, the screw you bit had gone. But there is perhaps not another living soul in, on this planet that I will listen to. I need sponsoring. This is working for me. You know, I don't have to have a sponsor that it, I'm frivolous with in out talking about nonsense and pally pally with, I need a sponsor who will inspire me to take action even when I know I just can't do it. You know, a sponsor is somebody that wants more for you than you feel that you are ever able to achieve. And I mean, I'll tell you a story about, um, I love, I just love this story. It's um, Bill W.'s he called him his spiritual sponsor, this, the guy he took his first step with, Father Edward Dowling. The, the night he met Edward Dowling, it's just, just, I think it's just a beautiful story. You know, Bill had a, had a hard day, been helping newcomers, and, and, you know, Lois was away, so he was on his own. He was, you know, probably feeling lonely, and he, he, he just had a hard day. It was 10 o'clock at night, and the, the janitor came up and said, Bill, we've got another one from wherever he was, St. Petersburg, or I don't know where it was, St. Louis, wherever it was. He's, he's here to see you. Do you want me to send him away? 
it, 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 the, the rain was coming down on the old tin roof. You can just picture, you know, in, in the thirties, you can just pick, you can just see the picture, the forties, whatever it was. And uh, he said, "Now let him in." And he heard this guy coming up the stairs, and he was str- really struggling. He the, you know, the walking stick was going up the stairs. And, you, you imagine Mike. Yeah. <laughs> at, at this stage, imagine Mike. I'll tell you when to stop thinking of Mike. <laughs> and he, and, he, and he, he could hear him struggling down the hallway. And he, he, he remember thinking, God, this, this guy's in a bad shape. This guy's in a bad way. And the door opened and he saw this guy and he, with a long black coat and a black hat and a scarf. And, and he came and he sat down, he took his hat off. And he, and he saw he, he had a dog collar. He, he was a member of the clergy. And he sat down and he said he had just piercing blue eyes. You know, he, he, he radiated a, a grace. There was a presence about him. Sorry, I forgot to tell you to stop thinking about Mike. <laughs> but but, that, but that's, that's the way he felt about him. And that 15-minute conversation was the second 15-minute conversation in AA history, which nobody ever talks about, which lasted a lifetime. You know, that, there was just that spark in, in how Dowling inspired Bill. And it, it, Dowling, he, he, he describes sponsorship absolutely perfectly. And this is what he says. And you just remember what he was like. I mean, this is a guy who was just crippled with arthritis and in so much pain. He says, one day he was watching some ice skaters and they were just skating around and they were just gliding across the ice. He said, they were gliding with so much grace. They made me feel like I could do the same. That is sponsorship. When you come in here, mangled, wanting to die, just knowing that you just cannot do it or you cannot do it anymore. If you're like me, you need a sponsor that's going to inspire you to do it regardless. Because, I mean, that's what's worked for me. And that that just sums it up just beautifully for me, you know, sponsorship. But, you know, why was I able to listen to all this? You know, because, I mean, I, I mean, it would always seem like they didn't like me. They would, they would always be. It's really, the truth is, they were telling me the truth. They were telling me what I didn't want to hear. It wasn't that they were ever shouting at me or being mean or anything. It's just that I, I, I didn't want to hear it. But the reason I was able to take it was because I had step one. And I don't, don't mean I, that understanding that I couldn't drink alcohol. It's just that I knew something deep within me, it just completely and utterly collapsed. My my absolute, the the unmanageability of my life was just complete. I was just completely dead. And I I could work nothing out of my own self. I, I, I knew I was utterly screwed. But what I would usually do is, and, and you'll recognize this, because we, we, we see this all the time, and it's step one, is I, I, would, I would go through life, and what would happen is I would hear something that I didn't like. And my pride and resentment would jump to the defense of my ego, and it just simply kept my life in a perpetual cycle of insanity. That's what happens. You know, that's when, when I will not be told... When I will not listen, when I'm going to insist on doing everything my way, my life just remains in that perpetual cycle of insanity and it gets worse and worse and worse. And, you know, we, we see people, you know, that they leave waving flags of moral indignation and they're right and they're wrong and they're, they're mean at that group and you can't do this and you can't do that. You've got to, you've got to smarten up for Christ's sake. You've got, to, you've got to get grateful. All these things, I'm not going to listen to this anymore. A perpetual cycle of insanity is what you will get. In, invariably, as we anybody that's been at this group for more than five minutes knows that they always invariably drink again. Always. That's been my experience. So you know, I thank God that I've managed to continue to be sponsorship continue to be sponsored, allow myself to, to be sponsored and just continue to listen and continue, you know, even just when I, I'm just absolutely certain that my sponsor was wrong. You know, the, the night when my sponsor said to me, 
you know, I just I knew I couldn't come to the meeting. You know, I mean, I, I can't come to the meeting tonight. You know, I, I was upset. I, you know, I, I didn't want people to see me upset. I, I, you know, I, I can't go to the meeting tonight. But at half past six, I was suited and booted, stood at the door, greeting newcomers. Because that is step one. Even when I know that I am right and I just can't do it, and my sponsor's wrong to expect this of me, I do it regardless. Because as soon as I start making conditions, as soon as I start debating in, 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 with my sponsor, it's just a, it, it's something within me which is just, I mean, it's, it's rebuilding itself. It, and it, it's called the ego. So I needed to, that's one of the reasons I, I need continued sponsorship. And I need to continue to be also a member of a, a strong home group. I mean, this is the other thing. I mean, you know, I was told from the beginning to have a, to have a strong home group. And I, I would like to say to anybody that is new, do not be put off by the opinions of people whose sobriety you admire less. Choose the strongest group that you can because your life depends upon it if you're like me. And, you know, I mean, this is, uh, this is, uh, it's my home group. And, and, and I, you know, I'm not going to go on about how great this group is, but I, there was, Mary used to, put it in a, a very good way. It's the best way I've heard it described. And uh, she said, she thinks that her kids are the best kids in the world. And that every single person here believes, or at some point believed, their kids were the best in the world. We love them more than anything else, that they're just simply the best. My home group is the best group in the world. End of. That's why, because it's my home group. It's where I stay sober. It's where I become a, an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, that's what I needed to do. I mean, those are the, probably the, the two things that I've needed more than anything else is continued sponsorship and to be an, an active member of a strong home group. You know, not somewhere where I'm going to get away with just turning up whenever I want to turn up. <coughs> not, not somewhere where I'm just going to you know, where I won't be missed, not somewhere where I, I'm just going to be, I can do what I want. You know, I, I needed to be accountable. I, I needed to be, you know, you know and, it, and it really isn't important. I mean, this, this is another thing. You know, it's, it's, it's irrelevant whether I am in so-called mainstream AA. I don't particularly want to be in mainstream AA. What I want is to be in mainstream society. And that's what AA has given to me. As the direct result of taking the 12 steps, being an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous, doing service and trying to help other people, it's enabled me to have a life outside of AA, to be an honest and upright member of society and do whatever I can for with Alcoholics Anonymous. So, you know, sitting in coffee shops, I mean, if, if you're still on the sick because of your alcoholism, claiming benefits, I've got news for you. You're still on the sick due to your alcoholism, you are still sick. It's useless and completely a waste of time sitting around coffee shops all day bitching about people. Alcoholics Anonymous is about getting into society, getting on with my life. That's what it's about. It's, it's completely ineffective else. I mean, that's what, in the result of the 12 steps, I've promised, it is, is a full and complete life. And, you know, so one last thing. I just want to talk about main, maintaining our priorities because, I mean, you know, we come in, we, we're broken, and we hear it all the time. You know, yeah, I'm going to go to any lengths. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything you say. I'm going to turn up early. And for, I was speaking to somebody earlier on about it. You know, I'm, I'm going to turn up early and, and for a month or two, they'll be suited and booted. They t turn up early, shaking hands, calling every day. And then all of a sudden it's, I had it, I had it tonight. You know, oh, it, what, what was the reason? It's, um, some, ridiculous reasons. I mean, it's just one of those things. I said, well, I've been coming 27 years and I've never had one of those things. I just go to my home group. 
you know, there's always going to be a reason why people have to miss their own group. That, that's fine. But to, to maintain my priorities and to get into good habits early is absolutely essential. Because if you're like me, you know, it's not all going to be roses in the garden. You know, everybody here who's singing and dancing is probably having a great time. It's not always going to be like that. Though, if you're like me, those are the times when you want to run. You just don't want people to see you. You just want to remove yourself from the situation, whether it's drink, suicide, or just run. So I, I need to, you know, having established the new order of things, I need to maintain my priorities over the long haul. And it's sponsorship and a home group. But I just want to finish with this. It's, I love the, the military. I was never in the military. Somebody said to me that, uh, when the last time I said this, they said, maybe you were in the military in a former life, and I like that. But you read in the paper, you, you see on the telly, you see people, you, these soldiers, and they, they, they won a Victoria Cross, or that they've done some heroic act of bravery, something just, and you listen to it, and you read it, and you think, wow, bullets flying, and they've rescued people, they've done just some courageous act, and you think, wow, how did you do that? You know, I, I'd be, you know, how did you do that? In Almost invariably, when they're asked, they say, we trusted in our training. So we get into good habits, those dull, boring habits. And when the shit hits the fan, when the spiritual warfare going on in your head and you just don't know which way to look, which way to run, just trust in your training. And if you trust in your training, and if I trust in my training, like I have done for 27 years, there's no reason why we can't just all continue to stay sober and just have a, an amazing life here in Alcoholics Anonymous. So thank you very much. And just uh, remember, no one likes us. We don't care. We love them anyway. Just keep walking the road. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.